Good morning. Glad to see you. Glad you braved the weather, the ice, the storm that people up north laugh at us for getting all freaked out when there's a little bit of precipitation. We're glad you're here this morning. We're going to sing. We're going to lift our voices in praise. So I hope you're ready. Here we go. Appreciates that. Let's do uh, this. Is a familiar song. I think you'll know this. I'm pretty sure you. We have heard 
singing y'all you can be seated for a moment gambaru roughly translated the japanese word means to tough it out to overcome obstacles to persevere to press on through tough times focusing on the importance of finishing a task and never stopping until a goal is achieved. Who would have thought that a southern girl from Alabama and a farm boy from Missouri would end up in Japan and find this to be our story? People told us, you can't get into the hospitals, you can't get into the schools. And God has opened doors for us to go in and minister. People told us, you're not gonna be able to get into the orphanages. God has opened doors for us to get in and minister to the orphans. <laughs> People told us, it's gonna be difficult to adopt. God has blessed us with a son and a testimony of his faithfulness. People told us it's going to take years for you to see fruit in Japan. And what we've got now is something only God could have accomplished. One amazing thing that God has done this last year is open the doors for us to start a church plant in our pediatrician's office. We met Dr. Shimizu when one of our children was sick. Come to find out Shimizu Sensei was also a believer who had a heart to use her business and her clinic to reach out to the Japanese people. Japanese do not readily enter churches, so even if the gospel is shared inside the church, most Japanese will not have a chance to hear the gospel. However, hospitals, schools, nursing homes, and other things like this always have people coming to them. If in those places they are able to encounter the gospel, then lots of Japanese will have an opportunity to hear the gospel. 
so that's what we're seeing at the church plant, is that people are coming in and they're seeing new life. They're seeing people's lives who have been changed by the gospel, and they realize there's something missing in their own. They realize there's something that they need in their own life, and they're beginning to be drawn to the love and grace of the gospel. I always felt something was missing before. After knowing God, I always feel a sense of security in my heart. Even though I have everyday worries and problems, I always talk to Jesus honestly, and He gives me peace. I guess what makes me emotional about seeing lives change is it's nothing I can do. God calls us to be obedient, but really the work is totally dependent upon Him and what He has planned. It makes the hard days worth it to be able to see Him really, truly working. We are overwhelmed by the work of God's grace in our lives. We know that the only hope for the people of Japan is the message of the gospel. And it's because of that we're compelled to continue working in this country. Welcome to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody. My name is Donna Madden, and I am a member here, and I am so happy to see as many of you that are here. You've braved the weather and the snow, the winter wonderland. Um, and just, I have to confess, right now the band is really nervous because we have always joked, the moment I get a microphone, I'm going to start singing. Are you all ready? Now, I am here just to welcome you this morning and um, to say that if you are a guest with us today, please go online to www.guest.gift. We would love to know a little bit more about you and to send you a gift. And also, um, before I leave, I have two things I want to remind you of. Um, our Christmas Eve service will be um, Christmas Eve day at 10.45 a.m. It will be a candlelight service. It is family friendly. We encourage all families to come together with their children. We will not have one that evening. And again, uh, more importantly, as suggested by the video you just saw, this is the season of Lottie Moon and international missions. And just last week, we had our World Impact Conference to introduce and to just celebrate the missions that Crossroads Church of Dunwoody is involved in. And we ask that you um, prayerfully consider what you may be able to pledge for the upcoming year, 2018, for our missions efforts. And if you need any other information about what missions we're involved in, feel free to ask um, anyone on staff, call us at the church office, and we will just guide you through that. But again, welcome, and let's sing some more songs. I believe the ushers are going to come forward. This is our time of offering where we're uh, privileged to give back some of the blessing that God's poured out on us. It all belongs to Him. So He asks us to just give back some to Him in faith. So we're going to do that now.
sing with me.
Praise God. You may be seated. It's a great season to bring some of those songs back and just remind us how precious of a gift we've been given at Christmas through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that you're here. How many of you uh, got snow at your house? Believe it or not, Jennifer and I took uh, two of our girls out to Athens for a concert on Friday night, and we were thinking they were going to shut the concert down, cancel it because of the weather. But lo and behold, they were not going to cancel it, and I was not going to waste my money. So we got in the car and braved the storm out to Athens, and they were making fun of Atlantans because they didn't see any snow. They were like, what's the big deal? And so enjoyed that, got back. And then uh, the, the electricity went out at our house. Anybody else lose electricity at their house? You know, not as many of you as you that should have, I tell you. Uh, electricity went out about, I guess, I guess it flickered on Friday night, but then it, by midnight it was out until about 7, 7.30ish last night at our house, so it was a little cold. But uh, we are an electric house on everything, but we did find that our, uh, what well, they told us in the house that we're in, it was just a wood-burning uh, fireplace, but fortunately when I took everything off, I found there was gas there, so I didn't have to go cut the wood and do all that kind of stuff. So we had some heat in our home, which, which was good, uh, but uh, welcome to the winter uh, wonderland. I just want to make mention, I, I, uh, somebody mentioned how beautiful it was in here this morning, just all the decorations and all, and I'm thankful. Are you appreciative of those who put their uh, acts together to do this? Uh, how many of you, who, who by the way, uh, helped decorate either the lobby or in here? Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to thank you for doing that. This just looks absolutely beautiful. Um, it just gives honor and glory to Christ, and I know some people have a conf uh, conf uh, conflicting spirit about, oh, do we decorate for Christmas or not? Is that secular or is that not secular? And I, I just think it is just b glory to Christ. We got stars on the trees. That points towards Christ as we have that in the Christmas story. I know sometimes people put angels up there. Same thing. Uh, these poinsettias are beautifully displayed and, and red, and we've got the green, and so uh, I'm thankful that we have this. Other than when I sit here, I can't see the screen. Uh, I have to look over there, but I guess that's just my own thing there. Uh, but I'm so thankful that it's here. Uh, we are going to be looking at unwrapping uh, Christmas here, and what does this mean for us? Uh, I'm going to be in various texts uh, today, so you may be flipping back and forth on a lot of Bible verses. Uh, I'll read uh, the, the, you know, many of them. Um, and you just might want to jot down some of these for further um, uh, study at some point. I, we've been in Ephesians, which is uh, well worth our time, but I thought over the next couple of weeks, I, wanna, I just want to back up. Uh, how many of you, by the way, Christmas is going to be here in, what's today, the 10th? 15 days. Are you guys ready? Have you, have you purchased anything for anybody yet? Are you expecting Amazon to be able to just get it to you, you know, uh, the day before? Which, by the way, UPS are crazy people. I've seen them driving. They show up at the house next door at 11.30 at night and honk their horn and deliver packages. Does this happen in your neighborhood too? Yeah, they are just crazy with, with the, the, the Black Friday and the Cyber Monday and then all these other things. They're, they're just going crazy. So do you, do you have a Christmas tree up and gifts underneath it? Any of y'all? Yeah, all right. We have a, a tree up. That's as far as we've made it so far. Um, but it is good to have trees. Does anybody have a big gift under the tree yet? Maybe got that hidden. Anybody got some small gifts? What would you prefer, a big gift? I'm going to ask this crowd over here. Would you rather have a big gift under the tree or a small gift? Some say small. What do you guys say? Just depends. Depends on what's in there. Big gifts. When I was a kid, I wanted the big gifts. But the older I got, I really wanted smaller gifts. Especially if it came with, like, some car keys just give me just a little box, car keys. I'll go find the gift later, you know. Maybe some house keys, which I have house keys. That's my Christmas gifts this year. I have house keys to a house that I now own, and I no longer own the former home. So that got all closed on Thursday. That was a praise. Um, 
I, I, I wish I could tell you all the traumatic stuff that went through the, over even the last week, but it's over. We'll just celebrate what God has done. So I've got house keys. That's a small gift, but it came, you know, larger than what I uh, was uh, anticipating. You know, sometimes... It, I have a child who says, don't buy any gifts. Just give me an envelope with some green stuff inside. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be very big or just write a check. Sometimes the largest gifts come in the smallest packages. And we misunderstand the size of the gift when we see the package. And, and when Christmas happens, it, it, both the church and the secular world may look and give, give pause to, to the main scene. They say, oh, look at the cute little baby. Maybe there's an outdoor nativity scene somewhere as they drive through and see that at a church. Or they go to a Christmas play and they, they watch this nativity scene. Oh, look, the cute little gift that God gave us in the baby Jesus. But you've got to realize when you unwrap that gift of who Jesus is, it's much larger than you can imagine. Back to our Ephesians, Dream Bigger study. God is bigger than you can ever imagine. And I hope that in this Christmas season, maybe God would illuminate in our minds a little more than just looking at this cute little baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, held by his mother and, and the warmth of her, her, her breast. That God is bigger. God is greater than just a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. I would love to go to Bethlehem during the Christmas season and be a part of all of that. Uh, the Stewart family just got back from Israel uh, and got to see a lot of things in that area. I know you had a great time. Emily, Luca, first time you've been there, how was it? Pretty amazing. And now we can actually recognize Jerusalem as, as the capital of, of Israel, uh, shock of the world. But yes, we celebrate that. I do. You know, I'm thinking, yes, I, I really am unconcerned of what Muslims feel about that or what the secular world feels about that. God is on his throne, and Israel has been his chosen land uh, forever. And so let's recognize and celebrate uh, what's going on there. I'd love to be in Bethlehem and see what took place there. But I want us to look back a little further and, and maybe get more of a, a bird's eye view of seeing how great maybe this gift is at Christmas, but it's greater because it didn't just start at Christmas. Leading up to Christmas, I want us to consider the Christ of the manger before there was a manger. I hope we can fill in some gaps over today and even next week and provide a more robust understanding of what this babe in the manger uh, really means. There are three things in, in, in scriptures today that I want to share with you about the Christ in the manger, and, the, and we're going to deal with the pre-incarnate Christ. Incarnate is when he took on flesh. Uh, God from on high came down to us at Christmas and, and took on the incarnation. But I want to look at the pre-incarnate Christ, the gift of this pre-incarnate Christ. What was he like before becoming a child? three observations in the scripture and you can take some notes the first is this this gift is his divinity is seen in his eternality that God in the manger Jesus himself was God and he shows his divinity by being that he's not time bound but he is eternal his eternality and throughout these verses that I'll share today and many others in the scripture, we see that, that Jesus is not just a babe in the manger, but Jesus is God on high. He was, he is, and he will ever be. He was a part of all that has ever taken place. He didn't wait to come onto the scene in Bethlehem to begin to show what he could do. No, he was always working in eternity past. The pre-incarnate Christ is a great gift to us to understand and have relationship with. Eternality, meaning being without beginning or end, a continuing without interruption. Throughout the Bible, there is an, uh, an indicator of a trinity. The word trinity is never used in the scripture, this triunity, but the God that is revealed in the Bible shows that there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit and all three in unity are the Godhead, who they have three distinctive roles, but they are one in essence and power. And this trinity includes this babe in the manger who was always existing. 
that Christ and the Holy Spirit in relationship with the Father have distinctive roles and, and, and specific things they are uh, doing in order uh, that we may exist and have salvation in, in him. We unwrap this gift of the baby and we discover that God has always been. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, is one of the first indicators to an English reader that there is a Godhead, not just an individual single person God. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. If you were to read that in Genesis, you go, well, who is the us? Who is the our? Why is there this plural language when it's speaking of God? Is God speaking of the angels? Are they the creators? Are they the ones who are making man? Well, certainly not. You see no power like that in the Bible. And so it must be that the God who speaks here, there is more than one individual involved here. There is one God, but he is manifested in three distinct persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we didn't say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this text, but we are given indication that there's a plurality working in unison here. Let us make man in our image. Now, if you were a Hebrew reader, you would have noticed this already in the text if you go back up to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Even as a small child living in church, you would, you would memorize this verse. That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The term God there, the phrase God there is Elohim, which is plural, not singular. Elohim, there is a plurality in unison that is God. So we speak about the babe in the manger, but we must realize that he was all at the beginning as well. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working together in unison. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Again, plural. There is a, a unity, a, a, a triunity. Later at the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language, plural. Even in last week's message, as I was uh, preaching from Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Well, who's the us? There's a trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Long time in the Old Testament, we see over and over and over again, there is a divine unity that is plural. This Jesus born in the manger was part of, of all of this from the past. God the Son is speaking, and he identifies in Isaiah chapter 48, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16 and 17, it says, draw near to me. Hear this. This is the, the Christ himself, I believe, speaking. That... From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God, speaking of the Father, has sent me and his spirit. Shows sameness and eternality in Isaiah chapter uh, one, uh, uh, Psalm one, I'm sorry, Psalm 102, verse 27. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Even into the New Testament, the Trinity is more clearly explained and, and displayed. Christ's union with God the Father and the Spirit. In John chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to these words. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now consider those two phrases. That in the beginning was the word. So we're describing whoever or whatever this word is. But this word is not only with God, this word is God. Two distinct persons, one united Godhead. God the Father was with the Son 
and the Son was with the Father. But the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. As some have wrongly interpreted, thinking the Father has a role in heaven, then the Father becomes the Son and takes on flesh, and then the Son then becomes the Spirit. That is false teaching. These are three distinct persons. There is a Father, there is a Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. And those three work in unison together, and all three are God may help you to understand as you read through scripture how the trinity works so this babe in the manger when he grows up and prays to the father he's not praying to himself he literally is praying to the father who is god but he has not given up his divinity he is god himself as well but they have an intimate relationship jesus communicated this eternal existence and relationship with God the Father who is distinct. In the, uh, the, the high priestly prayer that he prays in John chapter 17, verse 5, this, this, this Lord who is looking at dying on the cross the night before prays to the Father and he says these words, and now Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. His eternality, he has been eternal. There was a time that Jesus was with the Father and full of glory. And now that he has taken on flesh and is looking at dying on the cross, the night before he's praying, the, the glory you gave me in your presence, now that glory I had with you before the, the, the world existed. Jesus communicated this eternal love with God the Father as well in the same prayer. In John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, speaking of the disciples, that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I was with you before the existence of existence of the world. You have loved me. We have an, uh, an eternal love between each other, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now I've taken on flesh and I'm praying. Now that I have flesh, I'm praying that these disciples will understand and love me and see the glory that you've given me just in the same love that we have had from all eternity. That when Jesus was born, he didn't begin. He already was but he's inviting us into the relationship that's eternal between he and the Father and the Spirit. This little babe in the manger is much bigger than we could ever imagine, and his divinity is seen in his eternality. He was, he is, and he will always be. Let's consider some other aspects and attributes of of this babe in the manger prior to his, in his pre-incarnate state. Jesus himself was involved in creation. Not only eternity passed before all of creation taking place, but when creation was taking place, Jesus was not an, a passive observer. He was an intimate involver, an, an, an initiator, along with the Father and the Spirit. Not only was Jesus with God. Not only Jesus was God, he was fully involved in creating this world and creating your life. Rather than first seeing Jesus as a baby in the manger, appearing helpless and needy, we ought to see Jesus as the great God and creator of our lives and recognize it is him or recognize it is us who need him to wrap us in swaddling clothes. In Psalm 102, verse 25, of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Well, certainly we could read that and say, well, that's certainly God the Father. But do you understand that Jesus was there creating as well? Let me share some other verses with you. In John chapter 1, verse 3, all things, speaking of the word that we just spoke of, the word who was with God and the word who is God, all things were made through him. 
This word, Jesus himself, who was with the Father and is God, all things were made through him, and without him, without Jesus himself, without him was not anything made that was made. We think of this baby born of of Mary and in this manger. Do you realize he was the creator of all, and without him, nothing would have been made? In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. There's one God, it says. The Father and Jesus, who is our Lord. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, Paul states, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in the ages in God who created all things. You understand the mysteries of Christ? You got to understand all the way back since before he was born here, taking on human flesh, all the way back to creation. He is the one who created all things. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, 16, and 17, he is the image, talking about Jesus himself, he is the image of the invisible God. No one has ever seen God the Father. No one. If you have ever seen God, it is in the manifestation of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And he is before all things, meaning he has the supremacy. And in him, this is a great phrase, and in him all things are held together. Not only did this babe in the manger pre-exist before that time, not only was he with God, he is God. Not only is he God, he is the creator of all things. And not only did he create it, he is holding it all together. We think of this baby wrapped in swallowing clothes held by his mother, and you've got to realize it is not the mother who's holding him. It is this child that is holding all things together by his own power. That's an amazing child. That's an amazing gift. Let's not get all sweet and sentimental about the the precious little baby in the manger. Let us stand in awe of the majestic person and power that he is. Unwrap a greater gift than you could ever imagine. In Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 2, it says, In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And, it says just a, a few words later, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is an incredible Savior. Yes, his divinity is seen in his eternality, his eternal nature. His power is seen in his creation. At Christmas time, you may envision this baby needing to be held in a manger scene or in a children's Christmas play. But the reality is that Christ is the one who holds your life and all of the universe together. Here's the third thing, I think, as we continue to unwrap this gift of uh, of Christmas. His engagement is seen in his Christophany, 
that may be a new term to you. In the uh, Old Testament, when God is, is shown, it's either called a theophany, theo being God, uh, sighting God, awareness God, uh, intervention, or a Christophany. You know, Christ has been displayed or shown in time in certain lives. Jesus, as the eternally existing Son of God and the creator of the universe, continued to engage in his world, in his creation, through what some call just little cameo appearances through the Old Testament. And theologians call this a Christophany, a physical manifestation or appearance of Christ either before the incarnation uh, of Bethlehem or after the resurrection. Theophany is the same, a physical manifestation of God, which I would take the position in the strictest sense, all theophanies are Christophanies. And since Christ is God, all Christophanies are theophanies. When you see God appear in the Old Testament, it is Jesus himself. Let me give you some biblical references to help you in that understanding. In John chapter 1, verse 18, it states, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. No one has ever seen the Father. I would take it to mean no one has ever seen the Father. If you've ever seen God, it is the God, Jesus Christ, who has stepped in and has made the Father known. If you see Jesus, you have already seen the Father. You've seen the God that you desire and need to see. In John chapter 5, verse 37, And the Father who sent me has himself bore witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. Why was Jesus sent? So that you could hear the voice of God and see the manifestation of God. In John chapter 6, verse 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, Jesus himself. He has seen the Father, and he has been sent so that you could have a relationship with him and the Father. Because of this and, and other verses, most theologians believe in the Old Testament where Jesus is seen, it refers to Christ. Let me give you a few examples. Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 through 3, and I, I don't pull out all of the verses, but let me just share a few of them. And it says, the Lord appeared to him, Abraham. Perhaps you remember this, this instant. It was by the oaks of Mamre, and, and as he sat at the door of his tent in the he, uh, heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were three men standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. And he's about to be revealed that in his old age, he's going to be a father. Well, who were these three men? One of them, who is called the Lord, is Jesus himself. The manifestation of God, who has appeared in his pre-incarnate state, taking on the form of a man to speak to his servant. A little later in Genesis chapter 22, I believe this is another instance where Jesus steps in way before Bethlehem and, and speaks to his servant, Abraham. Abraham had been called to sacrifice his son Isaac. And it says here, the angel of the Lord. Now, this is a phrase that's very fascinating in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I, or here I am. He said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I believe that is the voice of Jesus speaking to him. Interesting. That Abraham has been asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he got to the point of doing it, but he's held back. The, an angel holds his arm, he's held back from doing so. And I believe he was being spoken to 
by the one who would be the son that would take the slaughter. Christ appeared to Abraham to keep him from sacrificing his son, and then he goes on and promises blessings. In Genesis chapter 32, Jacob, you recall, may have had a wrestling match over the evening uh, with the Lord, an angel of the Lord. Because of the way the worship took place in that moment, I am not convinced it's just an angel. An angel never receives worship. You see that when men bow down to true angels of God, they will reject that worship. I am not the Lord. But at times in the Old Testament, when it uses the phrase angel of the Lord, and they receive that worship, I'm absolutely convinced this is God. Christ himself, who has appeared to his servants. And in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, so Jacob called the name of the place where he had that wrestling match, Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Well, if no man has ever seen God face to face, it must be saying that is the Father they've never seen because the Father has no form or, 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 or person. He is a person, but he doesn't have a body. He is a spirit. He's not held down to a space. But Jesus, in, in his uh, sovereign choice, has taken on flesh in Bethlehem and even prior to at times and is allowed to be seen. And so wrestling all night, he was wrestling with Jesus himself. In the book of Judges, chapter 2, it says the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to, to Bacham, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Pause just for a moment. When it says the angel of the Lord there, how do you know if that's the angel or if that's God? Well, when you read in the context, you realize no angel ever makes a covenant with people. This angel doesn't say, I have a covenant between Israel and myself. No, an angel does not have that position. And so here it must be the Lord himself, and I believe Jesus, who is speaking because no one's ever heard the voice of the Father, but, he, but only through the manifestation of the Father through the Son. So the angel of the Lord who went up, and he says, I brought you out of the, uh, uh, from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make, uh, not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. And he goes through a chastisement of his people. The angel of the Lord warns and judges Israel, reminding him of the covenant that he had made. In Judges chapter 6, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And there's a lengthier portion here that you could read. And you realize that it's Christ himself speaking to Gideon. Not all angel of the Lord appearances involve the pre-incarnate Christ, but most do. You look in the context, you see the worship that's being offered and received. You realize the covenant language that is spoken, and you see the power, and you realize it's not just an angel sent by God. It is God himself in Jesus Christ. This baby in the manger is a much bigger gift than you can imagine. This pre-incarnate Christ not only is e eternal, he is not only the creator, he is intimately engaged in his creation way before that silent night. Perhaps you remember the story of Daniel, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or if you're more of a VeggieTales fan, they were Rack, Shack, and Benny. These three bold teenagers who wouldn't bow down and worship the golden image made by King Nebuchadnezzar. And as a consequence, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. 
While in there, a fourth man appears, and Nebuchadnezzar is up in arms over this. What's going on? How can they not be burning? And who is this other man in there? And he says in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the, the king, Oh, true, O king. But he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the, a son of the gods. No, it was just God himself in Jesus Christ. Last week, I mentioned Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8, and, and uh, describing what's taking place there, that we might be motivated in our atonement to be motivated to do missions and evangelism. But I want to read this again for our hearing, and I want you to consider who is being displayed here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each of them had six wings, and two covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And after seeing this lofty vision before him, Isaiah responded, Like the shepherds in the field, and like the wise men who came and bowed down, he said, Woe to me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the, peop uh, in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and, and having in his hand a burning coal, and he had taken with a long the tongs from the altar and he touched my mouth and said behold this has touched your lips your guilt is, is taken away and your sin is atoned for and I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here am I send me if there's any question about who Isaiah saw you ought to look at Isaiah, uh, John chapter 12 in all of John chapter 12, he's describing uh, the greatness of Christ. And then he begins to quote Isaiah in various sections of Isaiah. But, but in chapter 12, verse 41, it says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. Speaking about Christ in all of this New Testament chapter of John chapter 12, and then he describes that Isaiah can say these things from the Old Testament because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah's encounter with Jesus is the same picture that John has in the, of Jesus in the book of Revelation. It's the same picture of Jesus that you and I will have when we see Jesus face to face. No longer a humble, marginalized baby in the manger or a beaten, poor Galilean who has no place to lay his head. We will see a risen, ruling, reigning, resurrected, glorious King of kings and Lord of lords, high and exalted, worshipped by angels, adored by nations, and every knee will bow before this eternal King. We will see the Lord who says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was, or who is, who was, and who is to come. I am the Almighty. Is Christmas much bigger than we can imagine? This babe in the manger, 
is not where it began, and it's not where it will end. This God has been eternal for all time. He has been intimately involved in creation in the lives of the people he created. This was just one component at Christmas in his grand plan throughout all of history. Yes, we pause to celebrate Christmas, but we ought to truly see how big this God and gift is for us and how we ought to long to see him face to face the God who created us, the God who loves us, the God who is mighty and powerful and eternal. Let us pray together and consider this Christ as we prepare for his table. Father, it is in your grace that you illuminate your words in, in the Bible. And so many in our world don't give you any passing thought, but, but at Christmas time, they may pause for a moment to see you as some weak, desolate, homeless baby in a manger that had no place to lay his head and see you as humble and perhaps worthy of consideration, but not on the level that you deserve. For we as Christians may not even know how to speak of, of the Jesus who is much greater, that maybe when someone says, well, tell me about Jesus before Bethlehem, and we have very little to say. Father, I pray that you would embolden us with truth from your Bible that tells us Jesus is not just some homeless babe, but he is an eternal, majestic, powerful God. And he has been planning not only at creation, but all time to be intimately engaged to draw men and women back to himself, to glorify him, and to satisfy us with the joy that only he can provide. Father, I pray that this Christmas season we would speak of that eternal great God and not just some sentimental little God in a little package. Father, I pray that as we receive the Lord's table today, we would humble ourselves as we see, seek to, to, to see you face to face. That you would, like Isaiah, humble us. That we are people of unclean lips and among a mist of people of unclean lips. May you anoint us with your blood. Forgive us and let us be reminded of what you provided. And let us live with the heartbeat of here am I, send me to proclaim your goodness, to praise your holy name, and to, to let every man, woman, boy, and girl know that this gift is for them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. If you would exit out your left side and come forward to the table in front of your section, receive the bread while you're standing here and the, and the juice and then you may be seated. If you're unable to move, we're going to have somebody wandering among you uh, to give out uh, and distribute the, the Lord's Supper. You may uh, come receive.
want you to stand and sing with us. We're going to go out with a song of joy and glory on our lips.